Jeconiah's curse uh, and how Jesus overcame Jeconiah's curse. So in Gospel of Matthew, you have a genealogy given that is a kingly line, the line of kings that will rule. And Joseph is actually in that line. Joseph, the husband of Mary, is in that line. But the problem with that line is that it is cursed. In Jeremiah, we read when, when God cursed because of the sin of Jeconiah or Coniah, God said, none of your offspring will rule sitting on a Davidic throne. And now we see, we see here Joseph becomes in that line and it is a cursed line. So how can Jesus overcome the curse? So we saw here, when you look at Luke genealogy, Luke, Luke goes with a different line. What is that? If you look at clearly, Matthew says, Matthew begins or goes through the line of Solomon, who is the king, all the king's line. Whereas Luke goes through Nathan, who is not a king. It's not a king. And so that means this is not a cursed line. So what happens? Actually, we know that, of course, we have given Joseph, but Joseph was not the son of Eli. Joseph was not the son of Eli. Actually, Mary was the daughter of Eli. Mary was the daughter of Eli. By marrying Joseph, by Mary marrying Joseph, Joseph's name is given. So this is the line of Mary, actually. Mary is not from King's line. All right? So what happened? Uh, that's what looks us. Jesus, you know, supposed to be known, or, you know, people believe that Jesus was the son of Joseph. That's the idea that that is the word Luke uses. The reason why is that Jesus was not the true biological son of Joseph. Jesus was not true biological. But so what happened? Jesus was born actually not in a kingly line, I say here. Jesus was not really born. In the king, in the line of a king, but he was joined to the line of the king because Mary married Joseph. Because Mary married Joseph, and therefore he became what Davidic Davidic dynasty. He joined to the Davidic dynasty, but he did not partake the curse that was on the line of Joseph. So that's what I, I saw, I explained in the previous class. So please um, uh, look at uh, those things that are needed. Mm. Today, well, what I wanted to explain, uh, do I? okay, I wanted to go, Yes, I wanted to go to the date of Jesus' birth. So, as I said, from Matthew, I'm not going to read everything, but I'm going to look at important uh, passages, right? Important passages. Uh, and here, if you know notes, you will see the excurses. So, please understand, when you see the excurses, these excurses are very important. There I, you know, wanted you to see discussions, right? Uh, a lot of discussions would be 
even there. When did Jesus born? When you know what was his birth, or you know when was his birth? That's the question. Unlike Luke, Matthew does not give an account of Jesus' birth or visit of the shepherds. He does not. He does identify the time of Jesus' birth, placing it as does Luke in in verse chapter one, verse five. Luke clearly says, "This is what we read during the reign of Herod the Great." So. Keep in your mind, when was Jesus born? During the time of Herod the Great, right? So there are many Herod for your understanding. Not only one Herod, there are many. But when was Jesus born? During the time of Herod the Great. Herod was born in 73 BC and was named King of Judea by Roman Senate in 40 BC. Okay. So, as a son of Edomian Antipater, Herod was gifted, if not ruthless. So, he was a gifted administrator. Herod was a gifted admi administrator. He ruled with unquestioned power and was known, among other things, for both his extensive building projects. You know, the, he was famous for building projects. If you look at who renovated the temple in Jerusalem, it was a Herod the Great, right? As well as object cruelty. He was also famous for cruelty. Given to paranoia and fits of rage in his later years. So, there is a problem in the later, you know, evening of his life. He had paranoia, fits of rage. You know, he was so angry all the time. He had his wife, Maria, Maria May, and at least two of his sons, Alexander and Aristobulus, executed for treason. Think about that one. Think about that. Harold the Great killed his wife and two children for treason. So that is not that simple. It's commonly reported that he had arranged for the deaths of hundreds of Jewish leaders to coincide his own death to ensure that Jewish state would mourn his passing. Remember that one. Another cruelty was that he arranged the death of hundreds of Jewish people. He arranged. So when he dies, there should be a lot of Jewish people should die. So what will happen? Jewish people throughout the region will mourn. There should be lament mourning. So this was horrible planning that took place by Herod the Great. All right? Now, when did Herod the Great die? Herod the Great died in 4 BC. Remember, we are talking about Jesus' birth. Luke says Herod the Great died in, at that, at least, Luke says Jesus was born during the time of Herod the Great. And he died in 4 BC. So according to Josephus, Herod reigned for 37 years, adding 37 years to 40 BC. Okay, so Josephus is the historian during the time of Jesus. So in his antiquities, he's written about this. So he says, uh, 40 BC, he started, so 37 years. So calculated, yes. So the, the date of his reign began during 40 BC results in the date of 3 to 4 BC for his death. All right? 3 to 4 BC. That's the general view of the death of Jesus. You know, the, sorry, the death of Herod the Great. In addition, Josephus mentioned 
an eclipse of the moon shortly before Harold's demise. So there is a historical event that happened was that, you know, how do you say, uh, eclipse of the moon. Okay. And this has been identified with an eclipse which occurred on 12 to 13, you know, that area, March 4 BC. So in 4 BC, yes, there was, this is recorded, you know, eclipse of moon. Josephus also mentions a Passover celebration after Herod's death. He also talks about Passover celebration. And this presumably took place on April 4 BC. Lastly, archaeologists have discovered coins minted in 4 BC under the reign of Herod's sons. Okay. Uh, now there are coins that is that was mined in 4 BC under the reign of Herod's sons. So given Herod's penchant for guarding his power, such a coins would probably not have been minted unless Herod was already dead. So uh, we happen to see that there are coins in 4 BC itself. Since both Matthew and Luke places Jesus' birth during Herod's reign, Jesus must have been born before the death of Herod in 4 BC. Before the death, he died in 4 BC. So Jesus was born right before the death of Herod. Several lines of evidence suggest that dating Jesus' birth between 6 BC and 4 BC. 6 BC and 4 BC. In between was the date that Jesus was born. According to Luke chapter 2, Jesus was born in connection with the census. Remember that one. Taken when, while, okay, Quirinius was a governor of Syria. That is what Luke tells us. So the exact date of the census cannot be determined, but Quirinius was a governor of Syria in 6 to 7 BC. And, all, and possibly also 2 to 3 BC. All right. So there are two time periods that this, this he, he was the governor. This would place Christ, but no earlier than or approximately around 6 BC. All right. Who's born? Jesus birth. One more thing we need to look at here. In addition, Luke 3, one notes that John's ministry, which preceded Christ by only a short period of time, began in the 15th year of Tiberius, or Tiberius. 15th year of Tiberius. Remember that. You know that word, right? Tiberius. Tiberius began exercising authority over the provinces approximately 11 and 12 AD. That would place his 15th year around AD 26 to 27. Coupled with this, this statement in Luke 3, 23, that it was around 30 years old when Jesus began his, when he began his ministry, as, assuming that Jesus began his ministry not earlier than AD 27, and subtracting 30 years from that date would give, again leave, a date around 3 to 4 BC for the birth of Christ. Hence, so here is the approximate date for Jesus' birth. Hence, the date will be between 6 BC to 4 BC. That is the only approximate date that we can come up. The date of Jesus' birth. So what I say here, this. Many think that Jesus was born, you know, because when you say AD and BC, remember? Many think that Jesus was born on somewhere you know, for example, he, how, how BC calculated, BC, how it is calculated, like for example, let's, look at, uh, uh, let's take this one. 
10, 9, 8, 6, sorry, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2. Okay, that means from here you have AD, right? AD starts 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this is AD, this is BC. So many think this way, you know, you know so Jesus was born, except, so Jesus, uh, you know, Jesus birth divides the history. So somewhere Jesus was born right here, you know, under zero. First of all, there was no year, zero year, right? There was no zero year actually. All right, so that's something we need to remove from here. All right, uh, the reason why, why you know, before Christ and Anno Domina in the year of our Lord is simply to say that during this period, right, during this period, about 20 years of time period, Jesus was the prominent figure that was ever born. Right, that's the reason Jesus. Um, Jesus' uh, name was used, right? So Jesus might have born between 6 BC to 4 BC. Somewhere there was the birth of Jesus. That's the only conclusion we can born. Jesus was not born in 1 AD or 1 BC. Jesus was not born in 1 AD or 1 BC, as some people assume it. Okay? So that is the First, uh, first thing. So most probably around six, five, four in that BC area was the time that Jesus was born. Now, okay. I'm not going to spend much time on the other things. Now let's look at Important thing. This is something that I promise that we will look later, right? So today we are going to look at that one. Matthew's use of the Old Testament. Okay. Before we go there, I wanted I wanted to know what is mean by analogy. What is analogy? Can anyone say to me what is analogy? What is analogy? Anyone? Anyone knows what is analogy? Hmm? Because that's a word that we are going to use uh, here. That's something that we need to keep in our mind. Something comparable, similar. Okay. Yes. It is that is that, that's what it, it simply means something that we can compare or something similar. So let's put uh, so if I say mm, if I say the earthquake in Nepal, remember earthquake that happened in Nepal. Oh, okay. The earthquake that happened in in uh, in Turkey is analogical to earthquake that happened to uh, Nepal, right? Earthquake that happened in Turkey is actually analogical to earthquake that happened in in Nepal. What I am doing is, I am saying, I'm not saying these are these two are one, but these two are similar in nature, right? Similar in nature. That is what I say. Okay, now let's go and look at two verses. Number one, um, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Open your Bibles. Can uh, please one of you read? Uh, 
When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt, I called my son. Okay. Uh, what did you read in the beginning? When Israel was a child, uh -huh. I loved him. Okay. And? Out of Egypt, I called my son. Okay. Very good. Let's look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. Matthew 2, 15. When he stayed until the death of Herod, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. Okay, so here is, uh, we have <clears throat> Matthew is quoting from Hosea, right? So what we are going to look at, Matthew's use of Old Testament. How does Matthew use Old Testament, which is, uh, which is really important as we study. If you don't clearly understand, we might, we might be, our interpretation could be wrong. So let's look at how Matthew used Hosea. Now, Matthew's citation of Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, and his application of this passage to, to Jesus poses some problems. Quite clearly, the context in Hosea, Hosea refers to the nation's exodus from Egypt. Remember, out of Egypt, uh, about Israel, you know, God says, out of Egypt, I called my son. So who is this son? For Hosea, it is Israel. Hosea is referring, talking about what incident? It is the exodus from Egypt. That is what Hosea is prophesied, talking about. He's not really prophesying. He is referring to a historical event that happened in the, in, in the book of Exodus itself. So, how the question is this, how can Matthew see this verse as a reference to Christ? How can Matthew see this verse as a reference to Christ? That is a question. Now, the best solution is to see Matthew interpreting this passage either analogically or typologically. Remember type, type. Okay, type or anal analogy. So remember, I al already asked you the word analogical or analogy. So I use something here. Let me write down. Analogical fulfillment. So keep this word in your mind, all right? Or typological fulfillment. What is analogical fulfillment? It is not a direct prophecy, right? Hosea did not prophesy directly about Jesus Christ. Hosea just referred to an incident in the Old Testament. Now, Matthew used, you know, in his fulfillment formula, he is using it as an analogy, right? So something called as analogical fulfillment. That means, this is what it means. What Hosea says is a different incident, but Matthew sees, Matthew looks at an incident and sees some similarities. Matthew sees a similarity between, a similarity in the incident of Jesus' birth, Jesus going to Egypt and coming out of Egypt, do, you know, right after his birth. And so Matthew sees the similarities between how Israel 
went to Egypt and came out of Egypt. So there are similarities are there. So this is called as what? Analogical fulfillment. With both, there is a level of historical correspondence between the OT and NT text. And the understanding is that OT text illustrates some person, event, etc., in the NT. All right. So the difference between the two is that with the typology or type, okay, uh, typology, the Old Testament text is viewed as a prophet, prophetic or predictive. And the NT text is seen as having heightened redemptive significance. Right? So the historical correspondence in this case operates on several levels, both the nation of Israel and Jesus were led to God into Egypt. So same thing what I said. Now, Matthew used the word fulfilled, right? In Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, represent historical narrative. It's actually not a prophecy. But Matthew is using the word plural, fulfilled. It does not argue against the historical understanding of Hosea. But there are various ways you can use the word fulfilled. There are some time it talks about uh, predicting something that is future. But there are some time, just like as we have seen, it is a similar incident. When similar incident happens, Matthew will want to use the word fulfilled. Okay, this is one verse. Now let's look at, okay, uh, I just wanted to, or one more thing, and then I will, we will jump into the next passage. So here, what Matthew does, he applies the principle of God's providential care of his elect to a different reference. What was true of God's care for the nation of Israel in bringing the nation out of Egypt, also true of God's care for his son in bringing him out of Egypt. God's care is the main point. All right. Now let's look at the next words. This is also problematic. Let's, let's go to Jeremiah. All right. Open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 31. Thirty-one verse fifteen. Jeremiah thirty-one verse fifteen. Can one of you please read? This is what the Lord says: the voice, a voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Okay, that's enough. Let's look at now the verse in Matthew. That is chapter 2, verse 18. Let's read that as well. A voice is heard in Rama, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children are refusing to be comforted because they are no more. All right. So you see similar verses. Matthew is quoting from Jeremiah. But let's think about what is, what is going on in Jeremiah. What is Jeremiah talking about? Is Jeremiah talking about Jesus' death? No. Is Jeremiah talking about the events what happened during the time of Jesus? No. Let's look at as with the Hosea's passage previously discussed, so here is debate concerning Matthew's use of the passage in the light of the Old Testament context. We know Rachel was the wife of Jacob. And through Rachel, you know that several tribes came, you know, including that of Joseph and Benjamin were born. Now, Rama, what is Rama? Rama was the settlement, it's a colony, a settlement approximately five miles north of Jerusalem. And the place where Rachel's tomb was located. So Rama is the place where Rachel's tomb was located. It was also a stage, now remember this one. This is very important. This was also a staging area 
where the exiles from southern kingdom were taken after the fall of Jerusalem. Remember, Israel, you know, Israel was divided into two, northern kingdom and southern kingdom, right? It was, uh, I, you know, in 19, sorry, 931 BC, if my memory is correct, Right, 931 BC, Israel as a nation was divided into two. One is known as Northern Kingdom, the other one is known as Southern Kingdom. Northern Kingdom, most of the ten, maybe nine and a half tribes were in the Northern Kingdom, and two and a half tribes were in the Southern Kingdom. Northern Kingdom had the capital as Samaria, Southern Kingdom had the capital as Jerusalem. Right? Jerusalem. In 722 BC, 722 BC, Northern Kingdom was defeated by Assyrians from the north. Assyrians came, invaded the Northern Kingdom. So if you, I, you know, if you look at the Israel, some, you know, if you look at the Israel, here is the north, here is the south. I'm talking about the Northern Kingdom. It was, uh, it was I think, I, you know, it was invaded by Assyrians in 722 BC, right? Then Southern Kingdom was invaded by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC, right? 586 BC. So what, what we are saying here is, you know, the Rama, Rama is the staging area where exiles from the southern kingdom were taken after the fall of Jerusalem in 586 BC before their departure for Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar came, invaded Jerusalem, taken captives, and they brought them to Rama before they were taken to Babylon, right? They were brought to Rama. So, the children mentioned in Jeremiah are understood either as referring to, referring to the exiles of the Northern Kingdom who were deported in 722 BC, or the exiles of Southern Kingdom who were deported to Babylon in 586 BC. It could be either case. In either, the verse dip, depicts Rachel. Right, Rachel represented by Jewish mothers. It's a it's a metonymy, you know, of association. Rachel represents Jewish mothers. Jewish mothers were weeping. They were weeping, weeping for what? Weeping for her children who are going into exile, either to uh, you know, most probably to Babylon. So. Remember, she who had no, she who had longed for children, depicted by Jeremiah as being cruelly bereaved of them because of the exile. Yes, so it was, it was really happened during the exile deportation. Yes, mothers, you know, in front of the mothers, children were snatched away for the exile. Children were snatched away and many were even killed. And yes, there was really Jewish mothers mourned during the exile, during deportation. Pastor, there is a double analogy. Jeremiah itself himself is drawing an analogy from Rachel and the exiles. That itself is an analogy, and yeah, Rachel uh, representing I, the mothers. Yes, uh, it's, uh, he's using a metonymy. Remember when we looked at uh, uh, the hermeneutics, we looked at the this word of metonymy. What is that? Associating, for example, uh, uh, for example, we will say Delhi. And Moscow doesn't accept it. You know, Moscow doesn't accept this. Uh, 
what what is that it is the you know it is a style of language that is used it says that india and russia doesn't accept this one right so sometimes yeah uh, you know so the word you use the word delhi to represent the whole country right that is known as the metonymy of association so when when uh, when uh, Jeremiah says, Rachel weeped for her children. Rachel, the idea is that Jewish mothers wept for their children who are being snatched away to exile. You know, forcefully removed in front of them to the exile and some of them were killed there, right? So, yes, that is the analogy that, of course, is using there. Jeremiah talked about that. Now, the problem here is what? The problem here is what Matthew is using. Now, how Matthew saw Herod's destruction of the infants in Bethlehem, a fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. That is the problem. So the question is, did Jeremiah talk about Herod's killing of children? Uh, you know, if you really look at that, it was not Jeremiah was talking about. But Matthew sees some similarities, right? Again, best solution is to see, see Matthew using Jeremiah passage either analogically or typologically, right? So I, that's the reason I call it as analogical fulfillment. That is, looking at similar incident in the Old Testament. Matthew wants to see, look at it. So there, is an, uh, there is a kind of fulfillment, a similar thing that happened in the Old Testament. So Matthew saw in the events recorded in Jeremiah as a historical correspondence with those events experienced by the woman in Bethlehem following Jesus' departure to Egypt. Jesus departed to Egypt because, you know, he was looking for Herod was looking forward to kill him. But the Rachel, represented by Jewish mothers, and the woman in Bethlehem were mothers of the sons of Israel. Both were weeping because of their sons were taken away from, from them. Both could be comforted because, okay, now there's comfort because God's promise of national deliverance accomplished through Messiah. All right? Mm, okay. All right, I think that will be. Um, okay, now let's look at the next one. This is an interesting one. Let's look at Matthew 22 23. Matthew 2 23. Matthew 2 23. To read, sir? Yes, please. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He's, he shall call a Nazarene. Okay, he will be called a Nazarene. This is prophesied, it is spoken through the prophets, that Jesus could be called Nazarene. Now the question is, which prophet spoke this one? Can anyone say? Uh? Which prophet prophesied that Jesus would be called a Nazarene? I think Zechariah. What do we say? What do we say? Well, Malachi wants to talk about Bethlehem. Right? Bethlehem. All right, now let me go. I know that some of you are looking at the notes, maybe what is there. All right, let's look at it. Here's the point. Here's the point. Okay. Perhaps the most challenging reference to explain is that which Matthew gives in 2.23. Matthew says, Jesus' residence in Nazareth fulfilled the word was spoken through the prophets that Jesus would be called a Nazarene. Two problems arise from this word. The first is that the words Matthew attributes to the prophets are not found in the Old Testament. There are no verses in the Old Testament 
that you will ever read this one. All right. So the problem can be solved on the basis that only here does Matthew use not Matthew doesn't say this is spoken through prophet Jeremiah. Matthew doesn't say this is spoken through prophet Isaiah. All what Matthew says, this is spoken through prophets. He's using plural. Okay? Plural. The plural indicates that Matthew had no specific Old Testament prophet or prophecy in mind. There is no direct prophecy coming. That's not what Matthew actually says. Rather, the words Matthew cites were intended to represent the essence of several Old Testament prophecies. Not one or two, but several. But again, the problem still persists. What is that? This leaves the second and most difficult problem, I would say. In what sense did prophets speak of Messiah as Nazarene? In what sense prophet ever spoke Messiah would be a Nazarene? Now, don't think this is talking about Nazarite, right? You know, this should be should not be the case because Old Testament prophets do not identify Messiah as a Nazarite. Do, all right. Do, do not. All right. Don't think that Jesus was a, na, you know, uh, a Nazarite. Right. We are talking Nazarene. Nor does the end suggest such. Remember, uh, who was a famous Na a Nazarite person in the Old Testament? Famous Nazarite in the Old Testament? Anyone? John. Yes. Well, tell me what. Okay, sorry. Who is that? Simpson. Yes. Or, or, or Sam Samson. Or Simpson. Okay, whatever. Right? He was a famous Nazarite. Jesus was not a Nazarite like that, all right? That is different. Here the expression is um, probably means the word suggests that one who is from Nazareth, Nazarene, not Nazarite, Nazarene, because he's from Nazareth. That is what Matthew is saying. So people who don't look at clearly won't understand that one, right? No, okay, so it's not, it is a Nazarene. Now, so how do we understand? Yes, in the first century, first century Palestine, Nazareth was, was a despised place. Remember, disciples who were believing in Jesus, there was someone, I think Nathaniel. Remember John chapter 1, verse 46? Can anyone say, what was there? John chapter 1, verse 46. What was the words? There was a remark there. What is that? 146? About Jesus. <clears throat> Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Uh -huh. Can any good will come from Nazareth? Can any good will come from Nazareth? Why? Because Nazareth was a despised place where all the all kinds of bad people lived. Right? And that means, so when someone is called a Nazarene, remember that one, it simply means an expression of scorn and derision. Not a good word. Not at all. Someone is despised, rejected. That is what the word actually has become mean. Now we get some idea, yes. Does our testament says that Jesus will be despised and rejected? What Matthew is saying, what his readers would have understood is that prophets speak of the Messiah as one who would be despised. 
Psalm 22, Psalm 69, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 53, Daniel 9. All says, Isaiah, all would say, Messiah is rejected and despised. Messiah would be despised and rejected. Nazarene means same thing. His residence in Nazareth and hence his being called a Nazarene are consistent with these prophecies. By identifying Jesus in this way, Matthew is preparing his readers for the kind of hostility and rejection Jesus would face throughout the ministry, especially from Jewish leaders. In accordance with the prophecy, the Messiah came not with the poem and fanfare of an earthly monarch, but a humble, despised servant of the Lord. As such, this passage represents a direct fulfillment of several Old Testament prophecies regarding Messiah. Nazarene, rejected and despised. So two things he looked at, an analogical fulfillment, and here one, something completely different, a verse that we had to deal as we, as you look at the Gospel of Matthew. All right.